Hello everybody and welcome back. I'm Cam Christo and this is another 3.0 basic concepts video. This one is going to be a little bit more in depth because today we're talking about the state and elites. Reforms, privileges, the bureaucracy, state reach, loyalty and corruption. I'm not as ever going to be completely comprehensive in this video because I don't fully understand it and the systems are not yet fully implemented. But I'm going to try and give you the tools you need to interact with these systems in a meaningful way and be able to make decisions about how you play your games. So let's first off talk about some terms and what they mean. What is an elite? What is a faction? So here in Toledo, we have this handy dandy tab right here, which is the elites, the nobles, the burghers, the clergy, and the bureaucrats. These are fairly self-explanatory. The nobles are the nobility, the burghers are merchants and craftsmen and that kind of thing, clergy are the priests, and the bureaucrats are to a certain extent you, they are the state, but they're not exactly just you, you don't have full control over them, and they, like the other estates, have um, reforms and, and things that you can interact with and will evolve as you go through the game. You can see that the nobles, burghers, and clergy all have wealth here. They all have a certain degree of power in the province, a certain degree of entrenchment, and a certain degree of loyalty. Those numbers will be different in all of your provinces, in all likelihood anyway, and the average of all of your provinces' um, power and loyalty numbers gets you the estates power and loyalty numbers. The estate is not a separate entity to the elites in your province, it's just the aggregate of the elites in your province. I hope that's clear because that's a very very important concept to understand. When you do something to burger loyalty, you're doing it to all of your provinces and all of the burgers in all of your provinces. It's not that there is some delegation of burgers that represents the estate and then there are the local burgers. They are one and the same thing. There is a slight complication however there is also the factions and you can think about these as factions at court this is the influence that each of these groups have and met you know metropolitan faction is obviously the faction representing the burghers spiritualist clergy aristocratic nobles bureaucratic bureaucrats and chiefs uh, tribals we won't worry about tribals in this video this is the level of influence they have at court. And to do various things with the estates, you will sometimes need them to have a certain amount of loyalty, you will sometimes need them to have a certain amount of power, and you will sometimes need them to have a certain amount of influence at court, that is, faction influence. You will also sometimes, you need some, them to sometimes have a certain amount of power or below a certain amount of power. Both can very much be the case. So let's talk about some more of the stuff that's on this beautiful, beautiful bit of custom UI that the team has made for us. So as we can see, we have our five groups here, nobility, burghers, clergy, bureaucrats, tribes, and we can have a few different things. These here are rights and reforms. These are reforms, these are rights. The bureaucracy have reforms, the others have rights. I believe that is the case. I apologize if I got that one wrong. And then there are, down here, these are privileges. And to be honest, I'm not totally certain what you would call this. Okay, these are reforms. <laughs> the important thing is that these ones here are about the kind of state of the... Um, the, the relationship with the group. So church authority, how authority, how, how much authority does the church have? Church obligations, how much money do they owe the state? Church finances, how are they interacting with, um, how, how are they financing themselves? Things like that. And there's lots of different examples and we're not going to go through all of them. I'm just here to teach you how to interact with this feature. There are then privileges. These are basically just good things for the, um, for the nobles. There will be some for burghers and clergy in the fullness of time. This is an alpha. Those don't exist yet. You can read these and see what they do. You can also see that they have a level. These don't do purely bad things. So for example, sovereign estates. The estate is an island unto itself, affording its owners a blind eye to the realm and relative freedom within. The powers of the landlord are codified and they rule sovereign. This gives you more autonomy from noble power. So provinces will have higher autonomy. Um, than they would otherwise caused by the power of the nobles. However, you also get higher base hierarchy, which is basically how... Um, oh, sorry, I've hit the wrong button. 
how well treated the nobles feel. So it's not purely negative. You also need less bureaucrats per thousand rural population if you have this privilege in effect. Right, so you have your rights and reforms, you have your um, privileges, and don't worry about the fact there aren't any for burghers and clergy, they will come in the fullness of time. Next we have the specific ways we can interact. So let's start here. Tell me about the nobles. You hit this, you hit OK or C, and you can assess the nobility. You can see their power, their loyalty, their wealth, their share of land, and their share of property. Land is outside of cities, properties is, property is inside cities. Not totally true, but close enough for today. You can also see how much it's changing by. So you can see that their loyalty is going up by 0.08, I believe, per month, but I'm not totally certain. I apologize. I've got to... Let me just mute my phone. I believe it's per month, but you can check that fairly easily for yourselves. It's useful to see how much they own and what they own, because that means if you do things to these particular areas, so let's say you, uh, you know, you started doing something that would dramatically increase the amount of um, income that was being gained from farmland. Let's say you went around and built a whole bunch of irrigation. That's going to make the nobles a lot richer because they own 39% of the farmland. And if you look at the burghers, they own very little farmland. The clergy, they own a little bit of farmland themselves. So you can see how would irrigation affect the estates by comparing these three different shares of land. You can also see, you know, all of them stuff about there. Wealth and loyalty and power there, which is very handy. Secondly, you can review their privileges. This just represents this here. So that's why we can't review the privileges for the burghers or the tribes or the clergy, because they don't have any. And you can read them on here and see all the effects that they have. You can also, very helpfully, so we're looking here at the processing monopoly. Right now they have level two, which is a full monopoly. If we click on that, we can see the other levels. So they have a full monopoly, which gives these effects. We could make it partial or we could make it none. And that would have the following changes. So instead of 2% uh, noble gravity, we would have 1% noble gravity and all that good stuff. You can also see what the requirements are. So to go to a partial monopoly, you can't have you know none of the following, have none of the following things, 65% noble influence. So we couldn't do that because we have 86% noble influence, which as you will note is higher than 65. So well, actually, that's power. It's possible that that noble influence refers to this. Yes, I apologize. I think that noble influence might refer to this number as opposed to the uh, power, which is why it's showing up as green, because we indeed do not have it. I'm not totally certain, though. You can experiment with that in your own games. Next, we have uh, the ability to support or leverage the nobility. And this is implemented for all of the estates right now. Here, 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 and here, and here. And you can also curtail or direct the bureaucracy, which are similar, but we'll address them differently. I'm not going to read you all of these, but there are lots of different ways in which you can do these things to the nobility. When you do, uh, when you support the nobility, they are happy with you, and when you leverage the nobility, they are unhappy with you. Generally, these things cost you something, and these things give you something. So, the simplest example, land grants. You can give land from the state to the nobility, or you can expropriate land. You can take land from the nobility and have it for the state. I encourage you to read through these carefully and understand what they do. We're not going to do it comprehensively now. One thing I will just mention is that arranging a strategic marriage, as well as disowning an unpopular relative, when you have a fair amount of legitimacy, there aren't very many downsides to these. There are some downsides, but there aren't very many downsides to these, as well as ancient liberties. If you have as much centralization as you want, not a huge amount of downside. So these are good ways to increase the happiness that the... Um, nobility have with you. You will notice here that it says plus 12 relations between the aristocrats and the state and then below that in every province plus 10 noble loyalty because there is another way in which things are abstracted. We understand they have loyalty which is an average of their provinces. We understand they have power which is an average of their provinces. We understand they have influence at court. They also have a relationship with the state. If you go to the government screen F12 and you hover over the second one of these stars which I'm sure in the fullness of time will have their own graphics you can see that there are all of the different groups here and the aristocrats have a relationship with uh, the Metropolitan Spiritualist Chiefs and Bureaucrats of zero, neutral. That's not implemented yet. In the fullness of time, there'll be lots of interesting stuff with that, but for now, don't worry about it. The state, however, you do need to worry about. They have a minus one relationship with us, which is classed as neutral. I'm not certain if the classes actually work yet, so don't worry about that. Just worry about the number. And they have a resting point of minus 1.94. 
each year, their relations, that minus two, will trend towards the resting point at a rate of two points per year. The resting point itself, every year, will be timesed by 0 0.9, meaning it will get 10% closer to zero every year. So the resting points trend towards zero, the relations trend towards the resting points. Why should you care? Why? Well, because let's say you had plus 50 relations, that's very high, at least I think it's quite high. That's going to make the loyalty in all of your provinces trend upwards in all likelihood. It's at least one of the strong modifiers on loyalty in your provinces. Whereas if it's negative, the loyalty is going to trend down. Why do you care about that? Well, because let's say you're in Toledo. We've talked about taxes a bit. Noble levies. The cost of noble levies can be increased by up to five times by noble loyalty. Now, I hope you understand the impact that has. That means that if you're using the tax auto-delegator, as you almost certainly are, and you're trying to spend 30 military points per year, let's say you took your noble loyalty from 100 to zero. Now the cost of that is going to increase by five times. That means you're going to get five times less manpower for the same amount of military mana. So if you tank your, the support you have with the nobility in terms of their relations here, that will tank their loyalty. You can also tank their loyalty in other ways. And that will tank your ability to get things from them in tax. Because many of these, uh, the obligation related ones, the ones that uh, relate between you and the clergy, so new noble dues here, can be increased by 10 times because of your relationship with the local nobles, which, as we've mentioned, is associated with your relationship with the aristocrat faction. Okay, so that is loyalty, power, influence at court, relationship with the faction. You can support them, you can leverage them. Many of these are useful, by the way, very useful. So you want to read through these because lots of them are, they're, they're good stuff. We know how to assess the power of the, estate, of the states. We know how to look at their privileges. Now, let's talk about rights and reforms because these are the ones that a lot of the game is about the progression towards the modern state, the path to modernity and you are going to be changing these in a very specific way firstly you have to meet the requirements and you also need to know where to hover don't click on the image like this if you see this consider a form button you've done it wrong don't hit ok it will break the ui for a month ignore that that's a limitation of the fact that that is what you want to do when you click on the privileges which is how you consider a form on those so what you want to do instead is hover over the plus and the, sorry, the up arrow and the down arrow, green, up, red, down. It's quite tricky, as you can hopefully see here, to hover exactly over the right spot. We'll get used to it. It's the limitations of this incredible custom UI. So right now, oppressed peasantry, level two. This is the tenancy degree uh, that exists at the moment. This means you get less yearly peasant freedom. You have a plus 20 minimum peasant freedom and you lose welfare. Welfare is the main influence on peasant unrest and, and happiness. So let's say we wanted to uh, reduce that. We could change it to serfdom. That's a it's down because we're going from oppressed peasantry, two, to serfdom, one. Lower numbers tend to be more in favor of the estate. Higher numbers tend to be more in favor of the state. As you see, it will says the effect will be the following. You get even yes, less monthly peasant freedom. You lose that minimum peasant freedom of 20, and it's gone down by 20. But you get more base welfare for the... Um, peasants and the nobles will be pleased with you if you click this button it will just do it as you can see at the top we meet the requirements 30 noble power um, and one of the following either 30 bureaucratic influence and 30 aristocratic influence if we click this it will trigger a reforms pop-up which we'll look in a, look at in a minute as you can see at the bottom it also costs 150 admin points you won't be able to do it without those admin points on the other hand let's say we wanted to increase their cash dues right now we get 40% more base manpower and ability. They get 50% more noble power weight for siphons. That's their ability to uh, siphon taxes off, to money, money off towards themselves. They get more revenue tax, and we get a plus 15% noble investment in feudal levies. That's one of the ways of getting manpower, and we'll look at that in more detail in a future video. But let's say we wanted to increase that. We wanted to change it from cash dues to noble administration. They pay their share in financial obligations, let recoup their costs through lobbying and corruption of tax administration through bureaucratic service. So this would mean we get less investment in feudal levies, but we get more revenue tax from them and we get less manpower from them. They will be displeased. So first off, let's look at changing a, uh, a privilege. Let's say right now they have ambitious court. And we can consider reform here. 
So we could empower use of courtiership, we could go up to a ceremonial court, or we can restrict noble titles down to an aris uh, expansive court. I'm not going to go through all of the requirements for doing all these things because you can hover over them and you can learn about those and you can read all of this. But just for example, let's say we want to empower the use of courtiership. We're going to get more aristocratic influence. We're going to get five base relations between the aristocrats and the state. We're going to get more yearly corruption and more prestige decay. We gain loyalty and we gain relations as we do it. Boom, we've done it. Typically, you have to wait till the end of the month for this screen to update. So don't worry if it's, these things aren't reflected immediately. However, reforms are a bit more complicated and they're a bigger deal. Right now, you should be able to uh, understand some of these numbers quite easily, but we have 60 stability points, which means we're progressing towards 100, which means we rank up to the next stability, and we have an average of 80 non-overseas autonomy. Let's say we wanted to do this. We meet the requirements for moving them towards noble administration, which means we're going to get a lot less manpower from the estates, from the nobles. You probably don't want to do this at this stage in the game, I should point out. You click this and the event happens. Specifically, this event, the reforms of 1394. We can enact the current reforms, which will have the following effects. The nobles are displeased. You lose noble loyalty and hierarchy. This is in every province. And you lose relations between the aristocrats and the state. So... That's what will happen if we enact these reforms. Bear in mind, if you back down, you get recent reforms modifier minus, you get plus 5% power costs, even if you did nothing. So don't click this button unless you're certain you want to do it. But let's do it. Let's enact this reform. This is actually not that difficult. Sometimes passing a reform will cost you stability. It will cost you all kinds of other things. You generally don't want to reform when you have less than plus one stability because it will cause all of the estates to be unhappy with you because they feel like you're adding to the existing chaos so there we go we enact it and it's a great success the noble administration has been passed we get much more revenue tax from the nobility good stuff next let's talk and so the, obviously there's a lot of nuance and complexity to how you interact with this and there are, i'm not going to tell you which ones you specifically want to push towards getting although i think that uh getting your military organization up is one of the common early game ones but i'm just going to talk generally about how you do these things also if you're not in europe you want to try and push towards commercial law because that allows you to invent commercialism the bureaucracy many things can't be done unless you have enough state reach which is this value here it's the equivalent of power for other um elites or you need enough bureaucratic influence at court or you need enough uh, that kind of good stuff so let's look at the bureaucracy generally what you're doing when you're forming the bureaucracy is you're pushing yourself towards having a stronger state that's represented as more state reach and you're un unlocking new types of tax and then with privileges you're doing similar stuff and you're also attempting to handle corruption. Because as your state gets stronger and stronger, you need more and more things to help you handle the fact that there's tons of corruption around. So that's more or less how you're doing here. You can read the requirements up here for these. So for example, we don't meet the requirements to go from tax farming to state tax farming because we need 30 bureaucratic influence. That's influence in court, remember. So we can't quite do that. If we could do that, that would be amazing. We'd get plus one base peasant welfare. Um, we'd get uh, the ability to use salt exercise and timber exercise taxation. We get 20% less tax revenue transferred to the elites based on their power share. So as at the moment, based on the relative power of the estates in the province, they're going to, the elites in the province rather, they're going to steal a certain amount of tax revenue. This means 20% less of that will happen. We also get 5% less mana cost of all state taxes, and we get 5 plus 5% time state reach base tax efficiency. 5% more, that is, plus 5% times state reach base tax efficiency. So this would be really nice. We don't have enough bureaucratic influence. How do we get more bureaucratic influence? Well, now we finally come over to these buttons. And these are some of the most important ones, the state and commoner ones. Firstly, assess bureaucracy and stability. This one's pretty simple. It shows you your current stability percentage as well as what you're getting. And this is definitely per month. It shows you your average province corruption and where that corruption is coming from as you can see it comes from the nobility burgers clergy state and laws as well as what it's being multiplied by so more autonomy more corruption and uh, i think lower wages more corruption you can also see your national income as well as where that's coming from your national expenses as well as where that's coming from and your share of land and property this is what the state owns we're not going to go too much into all of this. I just wanted to show you that's what that button does. You can also review your rights and reforms. And this shows you all of the rights and reforms for bureaucracy, nobility, burghers, tribes, clergy. And you can see all of them as well as clicking on them to see what the multiple other levels of them do. So we're looking at tax collection. We're wanting to go up to state tax farming here, as you can see. 
Then you can review the bureaucracy. So this is just looking at their privileges, uh, their equivalent to privileges anyway. And you can see all of them as well as clicking on them and seeing what the other options are. Generally, higher numbers are better on the bureaucracy because that's moving towards a bigger and stronger state. But there are dangers because if you go too high, too fast, you get a lot of corruption. Now, let's look at the next one. Reform the administration. So you can do certain things here. All of these are moving towards a higher number on these values. Or you can curtail the bureaucracy. All of these are moving towards a lower number on these values. Generally, this means a weaker state, and this means a stronger state. As you can see, when you hover over these, it will show you exactly what it's going to do, as well as what you need in order to accomplish it. Moving towards being able to do that is one of the primary goals of your political game throughout playing Mayo and Taxes 3.0. Then you can direct the bureaucracy. Now, this is how you make the bureaucrats stronger. We finally got there. You can promote the bureaucratic faction. This immediately gives you plus 20 bureaucratic influence that will tick down at one per year. And you get influential bureaucrats, meaning plus 0.2 per year for the next five years. You lose a certain amount of mana. You get better relations between the bureaucrats and the states. But you lose 25% progress towards your next ability. And you gain bureaucratic um, corruption. It will also anger the other factions. Then you can expand the bureaucracy. Again, you lose stability and you lose stability increase interval. Bear in mind that stability increase interval can and often does go negative, meaning you're losing stability points. That's your percentage towards your next stability every month. You, however, get in every province more state corruption, more bureaucratic corruption, but plus 0.5 yearly state reach. You want to do this a lot of the time in the early game. As much as you can really feel like you can afford is my basic, basic low-level tip. Because state reach and um, is really, really important to being able to get things passed so you can get more efficient taxing. You can then align the cabinet with the bureaucracy, which means that you get a bunch of... Uh, sorry, well, one in all uh, likelihood, you get a advisor and appointing advisors... By the way, if you didn't know, I should have mentioned that earlier, potentially. You can see as you hover over them, this one is a noble, this one is a burger. If you appoint the noble, you get more influence towards the aristocratic faction in court. If you appoint the burger, more towards the metropolitan. So that's another way in which you can influence the faction influence at court. Bear in mind, these are really, really cheap compared to vanilla. You can fire them a lot to get the ones you want. Or you can explore measures to fight corruption. We'll talk about that in just a second. So what we want is more influence at court so we can increase our tax farming to state tax farming. Okay, so we're going to promote the bureaucratic faction. We lose 25% stability, get more corruption and anger the other factions, but it's going to be worth it, hopefully. So, so if we go here and look at factions, we can see that everyone has lost happiness. The aristocrats have gone down from minus 1 to minus 16. The metropolitans didn't seem to care too much. Spiritualists are down a bit. Chiefs are down a bit. But the bureaucrats, they freaking loved it. So that number's gone up. Remember, that will then cascade into loyalty changes as well. But now we should be able to press this button. But not quite, because we needed 30. And we're only up to 25. Darn it. Okay, well, I'm not going to be able to show you that. But you see what I mean. You need to slowly work on trying to increase your influence here. We could, I think... Um, no, not really. Aligning the cabinet would work a little bit because the bureaucrats gain 0.25 yearly. Uh, is it? Sorry, that's power. So that's actually... Mm, I'm not totally certain about this, but I think that would be state reach because power is the bureaucrats' equivalent. State reach, rather, is the bureaucrats' equivalent of power. Um, but anyway, not the perfect example because we can't do our tax reform right now, but that's how you go towards that. Now, as you can see, expanding the power of the bureaucrats tends to increase corruption. So you need to explore measures to fight corruption. One of the things you can do to fight corruption is have different values in here. Some of these will help you. So for example, we have a loose hierarchy. If we go to a clear hierarchy, we're going to get less corruption, which is handy. But if you need to do something in a one-off moment, let's say you've got a 62 bureaucratic corruption, pretty high, we could leverage the elites. It's going to make us get less stability, and we, all our elites are going to lose 20 loyalty. It's quite a lot. It's a, it's a ton, in fact. But now we're going to lose straight up five state corruption. And for 10 years, we get 25% less corruption impact of elites. Pretty nice. Or we could overturn the status quo, lose two stability, but you lose five state corruption and 10 bureaucracy corruption. State corruption, by the way, is this value here. So that's pretty good. But 10 to two stability and eight relations in the bureaucrats and state, it's a costly, costly thing. And bear in mind, as you can see, you're unable to enact another anti-corruption measure for 10 years when you do these. And you also get 
Uh, in this one, less legitimacy. In this one, you get stability increase interval. In this one, you get less administrative efficiency. And just remember, just read through all of these and see what they do. So I'm not going to go through every single one, but there's lots of stuff you can do in here in order to uh, attempt to lower the levels of corruption. So that's how you increase state reach. That's how you lower corruption, which will often increase when you try and increase state reach. Next, commoner interaction. One of the other values that will restrict your ability to reform as fast as you might want is stability. And commoner interaction is a great way to increase your stability. You can just give them land, which I won't go into here specifically, but you can, well, no, I will briefly, okay. So you can prepare your reforms and you can pick what you want to give them. Let's say resources, we want to give them farmland. Let's give them, right now we're giving them 10% of all farmland, which I believe, but I'm not certain, and you can test this for yourself. I believe this means 10% of all farmland that you own, but it could mean 10% absolute so if you own 10 percent and you give them 10 percent, that's all of your farmland i'm not totally certain but let's say we're going to give them 10 percent of all farmland and then we go back and back okay it's gonna be 10 percent of farmland in every province transfer from the state to the peasants you hit redistribute land it gives them to them you get more state corruption the bureaucrats are really dislike it and the peasants they don't they don't really care apparently <laughs> but it's going to change the economy it's going to change how things are working maybe they're going to have a lot more money they're going to be able to afford their basic life needs now and we will touch on life needs and, and how that relates to unrest in the future but more likely you're going to want to do things like um property grants i'm not certain what the difference between property grants and, l and land reform is to be honest those seem like the same thing to me let's not worry about it however things that you're more likely to want to do are temporary tax relief so doing this gives you straight up the 20 percent stability interval not bad and 50 percent instant stability progress very nice and every elite loves you for it the downside you don't collect any admin tax admin tax not tax like rent dues but admin tax like land tax for five, uh, three years pretty pretty you know that's a lot of tax you're not going to get, but it's a lot of stability as well. Or you can provide grain for the commoners. You can provide either 30%, uh, 60%, or all of it. Now, that sounds like you're going to buy all of their food. That is not what is happening. We will very briefly touch on life needs here. So right now, they have a life need um, of a certain amount. And if you did 30%, you would make sure everyone got at least 30% of their life needs. This would be at least 60%. This one would be at least 100%. So this might not cost you very much. And indeed, in this campaign, I've done this like all the freaking time. You get loads of stability, which is really nice. 25% very towards next stability and 30% interval, as well as minus three unrest. And it really, it doesn't cost me very much. That's because most people can already afford, afford the food that they want. And this is only paying for food that they can't afford for their life needs. This is one that you're likely to do a bunch. This one is also one that's pretty nice to do in my experience especially if you're in a position like I am right now as Castile, where if we take a look at our national income, we're making a revenue of 283. But if we look, 116 of that is coming from property. And a bunch of it is coming not from uh, rents, sorry, not from land taxation, as you can see that under peasantry, we've got 37 from that. Nobles, we get eight. Burgers, we get three. But it's coming from obligations, which are not exactly a tax and are not waived when you do this tax relief. And it's coming from our ownership of property, 116. So waiving tax only removes a very small amount of our national income. Looking at this per year before corruption and tax farming costs, it's only going to cost us about 50 ducats a year to waive all taxes and give us this huge stability bonus. So that's something that's worth bearing in mind. Remember where your money is coming from and therefore what these will have. Finally, there's fund infrastructure, but that really is only here because I think there's just nowhere else better to put it. It's not really relevant to a state and elites. This is just how you set what proportion of the infrastructure costs you pay. Okay, there was a lot there. I'm sure I got some of it wrong, but I hope it was really helpful for you. Please tell me in the comments if I got something wrong. There will be a future iteration of this video once more of these privileges are in. I'll do tips and tricks ones, probably talking about which of these to focus on and things like that, but we're early. I just wanted to give you this nice overview so you can see how you interact with these things, how you, um, you know, get the basics of it. I hope it was helpful. Thank you ever so very much for watching. Next episode we will talk about the uh, unrest concerns and treatment of your realm and how that plays into things remember the best thing you can do is click around in here read all of the tooltips read what everything does and hopefully now that you know what to click 
you'll be able to uh, start your process of modernizing your state. Good luck to you, and I'll see you next time.